Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Explorer Classroom. My name is Joe Gorowski from National Geographic, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been following along in December, we've been celebrating big cats all month long, learning about their ecology, the threats that they're facing, and talking to conservationists and explorers from all over the world who are doing their best to conserve and protect them for future generations. So today we're gonna meet Alex, but before we do, I'm gonna take a quick trip over to National Geographic's Mapmaker Interactive. So I'm gonna share my screen and we're gonna get a feel for where everybody is joining us from today. So here we go, screen should be shared. And you can see I'm here, the Red X in Alora, Ontario in Canada. And as we start to back up, we'll see some more classrooms coming into view. We've got classrooms joining us uh, in multiple places today. We've got classrooms in uh, Bracebridge, Amherstview, Milton. If we continue to back out, you can see them coming into focus. We've got classrooms in Pennsylvania, a few joining us uh, in Virginia, as well as Dallas and Texas. And if we take a quick trip to the other side of the world, we've got Alex here at the Red X joining us in Brisbane at the start of a new day. So I'm gonna kill the screen share now and come back, but I do wanna give a quick shout out to the classrooms who are starting to join us now on YouTube. Um, you can still get in on the action. There's a YouTube chat sidebar on the right. Let us know where you're watching from and send in some questions. As well, any classrooms joining us today, uh, take some pictures, post them on Twitter, uh, with the hashtag Explore Classroom as well. Don't forget to tag at Nat Geo Education. So as mentioned today, we are joined by uh, Alex Broskowski. He's a big cat biologist from uh, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. His research uh, has included lions, leopards across South Africa and Uganda, and filmed other big cats across three continents. He's worked with Steve Winter and National Geographic as a a uh, photographic assistant on magazine and television stories describing leopards, jaguars, and lions. Currently, he's working towards his PhD at the University of Queensland in Australia, and has just wrapped up filming a new National Geographic film on the incredible tree climbing lions of southwestern Uganda. So Alex, it is so great to have you joining us today. We're excited to learn more about your work, and of course, the students are gonna have lots of questions for you. Awesome, thank you so much, Joe, for having me. All right, well, it's great to have you. And of course, we appreciate uh, how late or early, however you want to look at it, it is in Brisbane, Australia right now. But uh, we're really excited to see some of the pictures and video, and of course, hear more about your research and maybe how students can help out. Fantastic, awesome. Okay, cool. So, um, so everyone out there, how's it going? I'm Alex, uh, I'm a big cat biologist, as Joe said, from South Africa, but I kind of work all over the world, so, um, a couple of years ago, I did some work with Steve. Um, we did some work on jaguars in South America and Peru. We were looking at some of the threats that face big cats uh, and specifically how jaguars are affected by things like the medicinal trade. Before that, we were sort of bouncing around Asia, Sri Lanka, India, working on leopards, looking at how they live with people. And more recently, I've been working on my PhD. I just finished shooting a big uh, TV show for National Geographic Wild on the famous tree climbing lines of southwestern Uganda. So uh, we're going to have a little bit of fun today. I'm going to show you some really cool pictures. I'm going to be asking you a bunch of questions. And I'm also going to be talking a little bit about the science of how we count big cats and specifically how we count lions. So um, I'm going to kind of bounce around. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm going to go back to my face. Um, I think sharing the screen is a lot more fun. Uh, it's definitely a lot better looking than my face. So uh, let's start off. I'm going to share my screen with you guys. Um, so who am I? Um, I've just told you I'm a big cat biologist. And I've been working on big cats for about 10 years now, mainly on lions and leopards. Um, so that, that was some of my, um, that, that photograph is actually of a leopard that was uh, immobilized. Uh, just let me jump in for a sec. I don't think the screen share worked. Do you want to try again? Click the green button and pick the option for the entire screen and desktop. Oh, sorry. Here we go. Um, okay. There we go. How's that? Better. Yeah. Okay. That photograph is of a leopard that was, um, actually, put to sleep for a little while just to remove a collar. That's uh, one of the best leopard trappers on earth. His name's Tristan Dickerson. And he's been working on leopards for, for nearly 20 years. Um, so this was part of my MSc research. This was part of my master's where I was looking at how leopards are actually affected by people that hunt them. Uh, there's the man who gave me my shot. It's a guy called Steve Winter. 
and he's probably the best big cat photographer on on the planet um he's been working on big cats for more than 20 years so he gave me a chance to work with him in a system and we've been sort of working together on and off for the better half of five years uh, working on everything from leopards lions and even jaguars um and this leopards are actually what i'm working on right now um so just before you guys um stopped uh well just before you guys joined me i was actually working on this i was actually looking at photographs of leopards from uganda and basically what i'm trying to do here is compare different leopard photographs to see how many they are and that's exactly what we're going to do right now we're going to quickly jump and see if you guys are any good at telling me whether these leopards are the same or they are um or they are different so um can everybody see can everybody see that yep okay so you guys are going to tell me if these two leopards are the same or if they are different uh joe can you give me some audio on one or two of the classrooms and they can shout out what they think yeah let's put a few classrooms on the spot what do you think mrs hudson's class yes do you think they're the same or no down. No. No. Okay, guys, look carefully, eh? I want you guys to, to pay a little bit of attention and just see. So every single leopard fingerprint, every single leopard print that you see, so the different spots, which together are called rosettes, they're, they're exactly like our human fingerprints. So you basically got to look at the leopard on the right and compare it to the leopard on the left and see if there's any specific pattern so if there's any specific spot that you think might be the same, because if they are, then it means it's the, exactly the same leopard. So just think for about maybe five or 10 seconds, see if you can hone in on any specific spot and tell me, you guys can shout it if you think yes or no. All right, well, Mrs. Hudson's class in St. John, Newfoundland said no. Let's put Mrs. Roach's class on the spot, see what they think. What do you guys think? Yes. 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 Okay. Well, let's right. see. So my answer is yes, and the reason is they're these two little, what almost look like horseshoe patterns. Do you see the um, the one over there? It's like two and two, and then one two below it, and the same there, two two. And typically, what you do with these patterns is you start with something that you think is the same. So it's like okay, I got two there, two there, okay, and then directly next to it, it looks like there's another little horseshoe, and then he's got a little hat on top of him. So there's that. So then it's like, okay, we got two. Now let's go up. We got another one that looks very similar. So that's there. And then we've got this little guy that almost looks like an inverted C. Do you see that? So there's C. And from that, one, two, three, four, we are almost 100% sure that this is the same leopard. Okay, I'm going to test you again. Let's do this one. Okay, what do you guys think? I'm going to give you 15 seconds and you guys give me a yes or a no. Maybe let's do two other classrooms. All right. So I'll give you a couple more seconds. We're going to put two more classrooms on the spot. Let's start off with Mr. Richard's class and see what they think. No. 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 Okay. We're getting a no from Amherstview, Ontario. Let us go to Dallas now and see what they think. Mrs. Elliott's class. What do you say? No. 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 Okay, both of you guys are 100% spot on. And again, let's just do it together. So let's hone in on this little block that I've made over here. So again, like the biggest thing here that we can focus on is there's an inverted C. It almost looks like a C back to front. And there's a tiny little spot there, okay? Now the next progression is it's almost like a puzzle. So you go straight up and it's like, okay, now we have this almost also looks like a little C with a little spot there. So let's go to the back hind quarter of this leopard over here. There's also another male. And I'm trying to find that first C. Okay, so there's kind of a C there, but there's no spot. And again, there's nothing in the sort of back left quadrant. And this one you can actually see is almost like a C and a C over here. So you guys are 100% spot on and there is absolutely nothing. But we are going to move straight into lions and sort of what i've been busy with as part of my phd research so this is some of the work that i've been busy with over the last nine months and i've been working in a place called the great um 
Albertine Rift Valley, and it's a place that's actually wedged between the Congo and southwestern Uganda. And this is one of the most biodiverse places on planet Earth. And it is absolutely incredible because per square kilometer, this place has got the highest mammal biodiversity in the whole of Africa. So there are more mammal species here in this section of rainforest and savanna than they are in any other part of Africa. And I'm going to play you a little video. So you can see one of the coolest things about this area is you've got these massive fig trees and you have these lions that you can see over there that actually climb the trees. You have these elephants in these big open plains. You have these huge salt lakes with these pelicans that live in here. Then you also have these wetlands. So you just have this massive array of different habitats. There's the little Jeep that I was working on for the last nine months of my life. There's a little tent on there that I used to sleep in every day. A little camera holder, a little uh, tripod that I used to film out of. So I was kind of trying to do two, two things there. So I was trying to count lions in this national park. And I was also trying to make a movie for National Geographic about these lions that live in these trees. And I was trying to take the lead of this fantastic photographer called Joel Satori. And Joel was actually working on getting these incredible lions in the trees uh, about 12 years ago. And he published this um, fantastic magazine story called Rift in Paradise. And he was actually trying to bring across some of the key threats that are facing these lions in Uganda. And that was, as I say, about 12, 15 years ago. So I looked at some of his photos and I was like, man, you know, this guy set a really good bar. You know, how do I get even close to some of these incredible photos that Joel has been taking? And I thought to myself, well, you know, I mean, he tried a number of different things. You know, he tried to use spotlights in the trees. He tried to use these cool little buggies that look like almost little four by fours where he mounted cameras to. Um and I thought to myself, man, you know, how am I actually going to be able to, to sort of take a lead and, and, and do something that's different to him? So I'm going to play you a little um, a video here. And you can see the landscape and also just meet the lions, the lions that are climbing the trees. Can you guys hear? Just turn up your audio. Sorry. Whoops, I think I just bounced back. Uh, sorry, 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 sorry. That's okay. Technology can be fun sometimes. Uh, yeah, let me just do this again. Sorry. Whoop. Uh, okay, here we go. Sorry. Can you see? Is everyone okay? Yeah. Yeah, we got it. So we've got Mom literally four meters away from me along two teeny weeny one and a half month old cubs and today is one of the first days that they've been climbing the tree and they're really new at this we've found two tiny members of the northern pride <laughs> saying to mom how do i do this this was not part of the plan they're getting one of their first climbing lessons from their mother Morunji. So that's some of the stuff that the lions are doing. And this population is really incredible because there's only really three places in Africa where lions have a culture of tree climbing. And this is what really drew me to do research um, on lions in this area uh, with a team 
that was comprised of uh, some guys from the local Ugandan Wildlife Authority and also some guys from the Wildlife Conservation Society. They were my partners. Mm -hmm. And um, Joe, can you still hear me? Can you still hear me? Yep, we just had another classroom join us. Oh, cool. Okay, cool. Okay, so so uh, as I was saying, so why is this population important? Well, they climb trees, and lions climb trees all over Africa, but in this area, as in one sort of main section of the Serengeti and in Lake Manyara National Park, which are two national parks in Tanzania, lions have actually got a culture of tree climbing. And what that means is that pretty much every single lion in the population climbs trees every day, except for when it's raining. Lions generally don't climb trees. In fact, they climb down as quickly as they can when it's raining because they don't want to slip and fall out. So this is really cool. And from a photographic perspective, from when it comes to taking pictures, it makes it um, kind of interesting because, you know, how do we tell a really cool story visually? How do we show these lions to people how do we show them to the world they're really special and this is where i really want to open it up to the hangout and, and see what people think so has anyone from the classroom got any idea how with today's technology we could be doing a photographic story and a movie about lions that live in trees has anyone got any ideas all right let's try mrs patterson's class what do you guys think about using technology and what could we do Okay, what do you think? Um, with cameras? <laughs> so, cameras, what other things, then? What types do we have? Okay, let's, let's think specifically, guys. Think about what kind of cameras, what kind of lenses. I want you guys to think outside of the box. If you could use any piece of technology, I don't care how much it costs, I don't care how big or how small it is, um, just, just shoot. Just throw out some ideas, and I'll tell you if you're uh, uh, vaguely on the right Thank track. You. Nice and loud, you know. Yeah. Drones. Yeah. Spot on. That is ten points. Yeah. Anyone else? Let's uh, jump over to our class in Virginia, Mrs. Uh, Polly's group. Your microphone's on. What do you guys think? What kind of camera or technology could Alex use? Uh, okay. What? Okay. A drone. Yeah, that was our answer, a drone, also, so. Yeah, anybody have another guess? Um, you got document cameras? Uh, document cameras. <laughs> I think those are a little better than the class. Yeah. Good guesses, though. Uh, let's take one more. Let's go to Mrs. Roach's group. We'll put you guys on the spot. What kind of tech do you think yeah. they could use? What do you want? A buggy. Oh. How about a wildlife camera? <laughs> like the um trail cameras ah yeah that's 100 percent right yeah so those those i mean we got some pretty good we got some pretty good guesses over there so uh for those of you that didn't hear the 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 the, the last um uh someone in the last group said trail cameras so that is 100 percent right we did put trail cameras in fact the uh steve winter that that famous nature photographer he came down for two weeks and he actually set trail cam like fancy trail cameras, and I'll show you some of the photos later. But he actually set them um, like right next to the trees to get the lions climbing up. Someone in the first and second group said drones, so that's exactly it. So, uh, but no one said like long lenses. So that that was one of the first things that I used. So I, the 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 video that you saw of me filming. So I was actually using a twenty eight to one hundred to. Uh, 300 millimeter lens. So I was trying to use a lens that could get me quite close to so like this photograph over here and this over here. So I could get super close to the lines, but I could also get super wide. But as you said, so drones, that is 100% right. And then I would, what I would also do is I would actually sit on the top of these modified Toyota High Ace, uh, what they call pickups. And I would actually get the driver to drive into the tree of some of the smaller trees and I would actually try and get as close as I could to the lions to get something really special and something really different that no one has ever gotten before me. So let's look at some of the shots that I got with the drones. It's our second day and we've uh, finally gotten a little bit of good news. One of the tourist vehicles has just spotted the lions near the Congolese border. And the cats have been seen up in a fig tree just to the right of the road. So we finally found Jacob and he is 
about 40 meters in front of us inside a massive sycamore fig tree. Now, the cool thing about this tree is that although it usually has low-lying branches with big leaves, this one is very elevated, so he's actually exposed. That gives us the chance to get this little drone up as close to him as possible. And the reason I want to do that is because, I, one, I want to get some really awesome pictures and video from him, and two, maybe get something that we've never seen before in terms of behavior. Hi, my brother. What a gorgeous boy. So Jacob's at this really interesting time of his life. Probably about two and a half years of age. You can start to see the tiny little bit of mohawk hair that he's got there. It's that little baby mane. And it's a sign that he's starting to really sort of get to a point where he's going to leave his pride. It's a very tough part of a big cat's life. And... Um, it shows, you know, whether they can actually make it or not. Because they have to get bigger, they have to get stronger, they have to take on other males. But right now, he's a, he's a fascinating individual. And so he's uh, super relaxed with this thing. It's, uh, it's amazing. We're just four meters away from him. And we're filming him and we're getting stills. It's super exciting. Yeah, so that was... Now, one of the coolest thing about this drone is that I could also get really high-resolution pictures of the lions and the trees. And this actually helped me to be able to count them. So now if you look at every single lion, so Jacob and his sisters, Julia, Natarinda, they've all got these little whiskers over here. Now you can see that every whisker is actually different. So if you actually compare like the left-hand side of his face to his sister, you'll see that the patterns on the first and second row will be completely different. Like for instance, Jacob might have one, two, three, four, Four, with a space in between on his second row and his sister might only have one two with a space and then another one two three four five so that's one of the ways that i distinguish lines when i was actually counting them so here are some of the cool pictures that i took of them this is a pretty cool one as the sun was setting this is his sister and his mother julia and Naturinda. that's jessica Here's just a little, another little shot of what I could do with the drone. Now, as you guys can probably imagine, I crashed this drone about four times into the trees trying to get this footage. And one of the biggest regrets I had was actually on the second day that I got to the park, when I went down to the southern section of this place called Ishasha, I kid you not, I saw about 300 elephants on this very plane. And... The day before is when I crashed the drone and I couldn't get any video footage from the air of these incredible elephants walking around these, these, these grasslands. So I also used uh, camera traps and so did Steve. Uh, so I set up a camera trap on a water buck that the lions had killed. So that's uh, in the north of the park. That's some cubs. That's their mom. You can see that's a pretty cool picture with the lighting. But then what I try to do is I actually try to get into the trees with the lions to get something really cool. So I used some off-camera lighting. Uh, I had an assistant who actually lit the lions in the tree. And you can see, like, this is really cool. This is, this is like something that no one's gotten before. And I was, like, literally half a meter from these lions. And I got them so used to the vehicle that I could get these pictures. And what I'd also do is I'd get a little bit of lighting off the camera just to put a little of, like, pop on their face to make it like kind of gold. And you can see this great cacophony of all of these branches in the tree with the lions in them. So here they are. This, these, these particular images were of them after they'd eaten a massive water buck. So they were in this kind of food coma. They were completely oblivious to my um, presence. Here you can see, I call this picture the lion tree house. I was basically like right in the tree with them. This is another cool one as the sun was setting. This one was like the closest I've ever been to the lions. This was like literally not even half a meter. And they were like 
I guess this was kind of like when they were maybe a little bit nervous of my presence. But this was crazy because there was like eight lions in the tree. This one was like right as the sun was setting. This is my favorite one. This is kind of cool. And this was kind of a hard picture to get because it was like the sun was setting and then I was trying to balance the flash of the, the filler light. But it came out kind of cool. This one was super close. This is a cool picture. And yeah, so I, I was doing that. So I was counting the lines and then I was also counting um, leopards, as you, as you know. And um, when I wasn't doing that, I was um, working with the Ugandan Wildlife Authority to try and fit satellite collars onto the lines with uh, a guy called Dr. Ludwig Schifat. So we were basically trying to keep a better tab on where lines were walking. Um, the big challenge in this park is that people are living in the same vicinity of the lion. So lions sometimes move outside of the national park and sometimes eat people's goats and cattle, which can be a really big problem because people get angry and sometimes hurt the lions. So by fitting satellite collars to the lions themselves, we got a bunch of money from the Shimitkovsky Foundation, which really helped us um, be able to do this but basically keeping a closer eye on the lines we can actually warn villagers when lines are moving close to a community and when they're about to eat cattle um joe how long have i still got have i got five minutes yeah alex if you want to try maybe two or three more minutes then we'll jump into some uh classroom questions okay cool now um I'm not going to ask this question now. I'll ask it when you guys are sort of asking me questions. But one of the reasons I'm fascinated with big cats is because they are incredibly important to people. They're not, they're not just important to ecosystems. So they're not just important because they eat prey. And if they don't eat the prey, then you have a bunch of bad things that can happen in an ecosystem. So I'll give you an example in like Yellowstone and Yosemite, where you have mountain lions that disappear then populations of deer seem to explode. It's the same in Yellowstone. Uh, we have no wolves. Uh, the population of deer really get out of control. And then that affects everything from the composition of the vegetation. It affects rivers. And we even showed this in India. We published a paper this year and we showed that if you were to remove leopards from an ecosystem that's very close to people, you would probably have an explosion in dogs, like stray dogs. And those dogs would bite people and increase the amount of rabies that is in the system. So that's a crazy thing that we sort of showed would potentially happen. Now, just in terms of why I'm interested in counting lions, lions are obviously this incredibly charismatic animal that's the symbol of um, power. It's something that we've come to love for you know thousands of years, yet we have very little information as to how many lions are actually across Africa. It could be as few as 18,000. It could be as many as 30,000. So I'm trying to work with my team and a really talented group of biologists here in Australia, South Africa, and even in India. I'm working with a guy called Arjun Kapalaswamy to try and figure out how we can count lions very accurately. Um, and some of the problems with the current methods that have been used to count lions is people are using pretty dodgy methods. So they're using... Um, these things that are called call-up surveys. So basically, if you can imagine uh, an animal that is dying, things like buffalo and zebra and um, even uh, the call-ups of a hyena. So basically, like if you can think of us putting speakers on the top of our vehicles and then playing them to lions and then lions run in and then we count the lions or even something as simple as counting the number of footprints in an area and then trying to come up with how many lions that really means in a system. These are really inaccurate ways of counting lions. So I'm trying to do that better with um, actually looking at the whisker spots of the lions and looking at how they distributed themselves through the landscape. And I'm using a new method that was pioneered in the Maasai Mara of Kenya in Uganda to try and get a really good hold on how many lions the system has. Um, so we counted lines earlier this year. We drove nearly 8,000 kilometers in three months looking for lions. Uh, we actually spotted 30 individual lions uh, 155 times across the study area. You can see they're there. This section over here is actually where we found lions. So the hotter the area, so the more red it is, the more lions we detected. This is how hard we looked. So where we drove through the landscape. 
And from this, we actually figured out that there's probably no more than about three lions for every hundred square kilometers, which is about an eighth as rich as the Maasai Mara. So in this particular system, where the lions are climbing the trees, we actually, our data is showing that the lions are probably in trouble. And the main reason is because there's not enough prey for them. Um, so yeah, but Joe, that's where I'm going to sort of leave it for now. Uh, and then we can talk about sort of more uh, on the photo side of things. And I'm happy to talk about the science, but I know we pushed for time. So let's open it up. And um, I know that was a mouthful at the end. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, Alex, thanks so much. I mean, the work you're doing is awesome. You're really using some innovative ways to get in the field and get that footage back to us. So really cool. And thanks so much for sharing it with our classrooms today. Much appreciated. Thank you for listening. All right. Well, just a quick reminder to any classrooms viewing on YouTube, use the YouTube chat sidebar, send us in any questions. If you do have some, let us know where you're watching from. But for now, let's start meeting some of our classrooms. So let's get started. Let's go to Virginia to start. Grade threes with Mrs. Polly. Let me turn her microphone on. How are we doing grade threes? Michael, you might have to come up here so they can hear you. Sorry, I just heard locals in the same environment as big cats. Can you just ask me one more time? Oh. Come closer. What are some strategies you teach the locals to live in the same environment with the big cats? Um, so... I mean, uh, I, I, in, in, in the area where I worked, I wasn't um, directly working with the communities, but there is a really good uh, uh, vet, actually, who works with the local community there. Um, his name is Dr. Ludwig Schifat, and he works with a program called the Uganda Carnival Program, and he actually um, works with one of the main fishing villages that's actually located just on the side of the park. And what he does is he works with the local community, um, with the local cattle farmers. And what he does is he actually helps them to build fences around the places where they keep their cattle. Now, his basic rule is that when lions go into a fence that is storing their cattle at night and the lions actually kill the cows, then he has a program where he actually allows people to claim money back for any losses that are incurred. Um, but the rule with that program is that only people that actually use the fencing around the cows um, can actually claim money. But um, he's worked in the park for more than 20 years. He's a real expert in that front. And um, yeah, he's, uh, I think he's the sort of main reason why lions in that northern section of the park are actually still alive and not uh, completely extinct. All right. Great question to start us off. Let's take a quick trip. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. St. John's, Newfoundland, grade four is with Mrs. Hudson. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, St. John's? Good. Good. All right. Go ahead, bud. How many, how many lions are illegally hunted a year? That's a very good question. What's your name? Ben. Okay, Ben. That's a really good question, man. Um, so, basically, lion hunting in Africa comes really in two flavors, okay? There's the first, which is legal hunting, which is like a lot of the stuff you hear about in the news, which... We all think is really bad. You remember Cecil the lion, the lion that was killed in Zimbabwe by trophy hunters. So that's one form of hunters where people actually pay to shoot lions. And then there's the other form, which is illegal hunting. So lions are a protected species. They're a protected species on CITES and a number of different conventions that actually govern the protection of lions as a species in Africa. So all of the places where lions live, you cannot just go in and kill them, whether it's for a skin or for their teeth or whatever. It's illegal, right? But the big problem is that it's very difficult to actually quantify, so to measure how many lions are being killed illegally. 
It's one thing to measure how many are being killed legally because there's a governing framework called CITES. Now that's called the Convention on the Endangered on the Trade in Endangered Species. And basically, if you go and legally pay to shoot a lion and export its trophy, that is monitored through the local government and through CITES, and you have to register a tag. So although that's maybe a lot of us think is a very bad thing to do to kill a lion for fun. That at least can be monitored and quantified. So we know how many lions are being killed legally. But illegally, it's very difficult to know how many poachers are killing lions, whether it's for their teeth, for their skins, how many lions are dying in these big cable snares. So these things that are being set in the bush to catch things that lions eat, to feed people's families. Lions sometimes step into those things and accidentally get caught. So it's a, it's a very good question, but the answer is not easy because we don't know how many lions are being killed every year illegally. There are some estimates like broadly you can kind of try and measure based on how many lion carcasses are found in snares, but it's very difficult to extrapolate because just because of the sheer size of these areas and how difficult it is to monitor them. Does that answer your question, Ben? All right, thumbs up. That's a good sign. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Mrs. Patterson's grade five sixes in Milton, Ontario this time. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing, Milton? How are we doing, guys? Good. You talked about the movie where you like took a camera and you went around. So is that movie like out yet? It is, it is. So it came out on Big Cat Week, I think, 10 days ago. And you guys can watch it on demand. It's on Nat Geo Wild. And it's called Tree Climbing Lions. Um, if you just type in Tree Climbing Lions, Nat Geo Wild in Google, you'll find it. You can watch it online and you can watch it. Um, but you can watch it actually on cable in your uh, on your tv it's on demand you can just you can just find it but um it's on local listings yeah all right excellent well congratulations that was probably pretty exciting uh let's see let's go to mrs elliott's grade sevens in dallas texas let me turn their microphone on how we doing texas great how oh, long have a bit better than that let's try that again texas how you guys doing? Good. There we go. How long have you been away from home? Where do you stay on your expeditions? And how many people are on your team? Okay, let's just take it one by one. So uh, how long have I been away from home? What is the second one? Where do you stay on your expeditions? Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take these. What's your name? Shelby. Okay, cool. That's a very good multiple question question, Shelby. Um, so the first part is how long have I been away from home? Well, this year has been a really bad one. Like I've been home, I think maybe two weeks, like home home as in South Africa, like, uh, like with my family, with my parents. Um, and that's just because I traveled so much. So I, I spent most of my year in Uganda. Um, the other parts of my year, I spent a little bit in South Africa covering uh, some rhino translocations. Then I went to Chad to go and cover some another rhino translocation over there. And then I was kind of bouncing around the USA. I did some talks in, in, in Vegas. But we, we when we're working, like uh, we don't spend a lot of time at home. And the longest expedition that I've ever been on was with Steve Winter covering leopards uh, two years ago. And we were away one period straight was four months um where do we stay we stay in a bunch of different places so like it can be in small tents it depends on like where we like a lot of the time this year when i was living in the field i was living out of a tent like on top of my car you saw that little like gray thing um and sometimes we can stay in like a hotel like a cheap hotel like lodges uh, we don't spend a lot of money on lodging like just because we don't have a lot of money to spend on that um and then how many people, you know what, to, to be really honest, like you want to keep your team quite small, especially if, you, if you're if you doing research, it's one thing, like you, you can maybe have like three or four people 
Um, for, for the lion count stuff that I was doing, uh, we had a team of five. It was usually sort of five, two vehicles looking for lions every day. Um, when it comes to like filming TV shows, teams of about five people usually work really well because of the kinds of films that we're making, the kinds of films that I've made with Steve. We're always kind of covering the human angle. And it's very difficult to move in a big team, right? And also, even when you're filming wildlife, you never got more than two people at any point in a tent or in a hide uh, or in a vehicle filming because you just want to be as quiet and as low-key as possible. So usually teams of about anything from two, sometimes one, up to five people, depending on what you're filming and what you're doing. All right, let's jump back to Ontario. We have Mr. Richards class joining us uh, in Amherstview, Ontario. They're grade five sixes as well. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing five sixes? Good. Perfect. Hey. Bye, what is the most unique animal you've seen? Um, the most unique animal I've seen? Oh, that's a difficult question. Um, Hmm. You know what? I, 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 don't, I won't say unique animal, but I will say unique situation. The coolest thing that I've ever seen and like kind of taken a picture of with Steve actually was a leopard on the beach in Sri Lanka. That was by far the coolest thing I've ever seen, like seeing cat tracks, seeing the tracks of a big cat on the beach in Yala National Park in Sri Lanka, like with the waves crashing in the background was by far the coolest animal related thing I've ever seen. The second coolest was seeing a leopard on the edge of a city of like the 12th largest city in the world in Mumbai, a big male, 80 kilogram male leopard, like walking on the back of a city was the coolest, also second coolest thing. And again, it was a leopard. Um, and then, yeah, I guess your yeah, lions in trees comes like third, but in terms of like unique animal, yeah, I, I can't say like unique animal. It's got to be like the situation of an animal in a unique habitat. That to me is a lot more interesting than just some unique animal. Sorry, that that's my, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's a great answer. That's perfect. Uh, where do we go next? Let's go to uh, Virginia. We have grade eights joining us with Mrs. Roach. Let me turn their microphone on. How are we doing grade eights? <laughs> Oh, did you guys have to, their period must have ended. They must have had to duck out. All right, that's okay. Uh, and then our final classroom that's joining us live is Mrs. Forsyth's group in Bracebridge, Ontario, some high school students. Uh, you're just off of my screen. Oh, no, you're back on it now. There we go. How are we doing, grade nines? Yeah. All right, who's got the question? Owen. <laughs> What's the question? Owen. Oh, what? What's the question? About why is there why is there why is there legal? If they're endangered, why is it legal? Um, if the lions are endangered, why is there legal hunting? Um. Okay. So, um, this is an important question. So, currently, as it stands. The, the regulations surrounding uh, lion trophy hunting are, it's not banned, right? And, the, the, you know, again, it, it all comes down to sort of the, the threatened sort of species status um, um, of the um, lions themselves. And um, so the, the lion is technically on Appendix 1 uh, of, of CITES, but there have been a lot of arguments made by the conservation and the uh, trophy hunting community that lion trophy hunting is, uh, because it raises so much money, some of that money goes back into managing and helping to manage the protected areas where lions live. Now, unfortunately, a lot of the science surrounding trophy hunting doesn't really match up to a lot of the claims that are being made. So like sustainable lion hunting, so where lion populations don't decline, only works really maybe in one or two sites in the whole of Africa. 
in the majority of places where lion hunting is happening, it's not being done in a very ethical and indefinitely a very science-driven way. So if you look at Zambia, Tanzania, um, parts of um, Zimbabwe, uh, in, in parts of um, Namibia, lion hunting is not being done in a very robust and... Uh, so when I say science-driven approach, it's not being done on really robust numbers. And there's no really good data to show that lion populations are not adversely or negatively affected by by hunting but but to answer your question the 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 there is just a lot of money involved and the arguments um financially are just i guess too great at this stage for for um the big science driven entities whether it's uh, the iuc and cites and a lot of the local countries that are actually governing uh how many lions are being hunted in the countries they just they haven't banned it yet. There is one decent place in Mozambique in a place called Nyasa where lion hunting doesn't seem to adversely affect lion populations. But that's literally a, a one in a and a handful of 10 sites where lions are hunted across Africa. Does that answer your question? Yes. All right. Well, Alex, uh, first of all, thank you so much for staying up to hang out with us tonight. Uh, you're, the work you're doing is so great from the filmmaking to the conservation work. So thank you so much for doing it and being so open to sharing it with our classrooms here on Explore Classroom. Um, classrooms, thank you so much for joining us. Your questions, as always, were great. Alex, if they want to shoot you some more questions via Twitter, what's your handle? You know what, the easiest, uh, they're both. So the easiest way to follow some of my um, pictures and, and sort of my, 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 my video content is actually just my name. So it's at Alex Brachkovsky. Um, yeah, and then basically um, the same is Twitter. So at Alex Brachkovsky, I've got a long surname, but um, that's the easiest way. And then also at Nat Geo Wild, you can see a lot of my stuff on there. Perfect. Well, I'll pass on a few links to um, the classrooms. The classrooms who are joining us, please post some pictures on Twitter, hashtag Explore Classroom and at Nat Geo Education to tag. Um, just a quick reminder, at 10 o'clock, so in about 11 minutes from now, we're going live in Argentina with an explorer who's going to take us out into the field and show us the penguins he's researching. So that should be a lot of fun. Tune in if you can. And again, Alex, thank you so much for joining us today. It was a lot of fun and we look forward to some hangouts in the future. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed the pictures. See you later. All right. Microphones are coming on, boys and girls. Nice and loud. Bye and thank you. Here we go. Bye. Thank you so much. All right. Again, everyone, thanks so much for hanging out. Enjoy the rest of your days. Alex, get some sleep, and we'll see you next time on the Explore Classroom. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Bye.